is Dr. Miranda Bain. Um, Miranda's making a return to her roots in Guernsey, if only digitally. Um, her research has links to all the Channel Islands, and she's helped to create our pollinator projects to enhance our invertebrate populations. Uh, I doubt there's anyone who could be more informed on pollinators than Miranda, and I look forward to hearing about pollinators past, present and future. There we go. Can you hear me now? <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you. So, thank you for the introduction. Um, let me just check. I can move forward to the next slide. Yeah, here we go. Um, so, yeah, title slide. We don't need to dwell on that. Um, I've put my emails up on this slide and I've got them at the end of the talk as well, because um, with this talk, what I'd really like to do is open, um, open the conversation up for collaboration and communication. So I really would love people to get in touch with me about this if they've got questions or if they've got any ideas that they can contribute. So just to make it clear, that's me in the middle. Um, I am employed by the University of Bristol and I work within the Community Ecology Group, which mainly focuses on pollination. That's led by Jane Mehmet, who you may know as the president of the British Ecological Society. And she absolutely loves island ecology. So she's really interested to be involved in this project. Sadly, can't be here today. Um, and then I'm working with the Pollinator Project in Guernsey. Um, so. I've probably been, we've probably been building this partnership for about a year and I officially started working um, in April. Now, obviously, all of our plans were thrown up in the air because of COVID, but we've managed to get some survey work done this summer. So in this talk, I'm going to talk to you about my sort of aim to describe, to monitor and to improve pollinator populations on Guernsey and on the other Channel Islands. So I'm going to break it down into these three different sections, the past, the present and the future, um, and talk to you about the kind of data that we need in order to understand what's going on with pollinators. And just to sandwich that in with the why are we doing this? Uh, what is the point of it? And also what's the kind of greater context of this? So what could we learn from the UK and their pollinator strategies? Now, I'm sure I don't need to tell anyone here, but globally, pollinators are in decline. Um, and I'm specifically talking about insect pollinators. So bees, butterflies, moths, beetles, flies, um, there's, there's thousands of them. So just looking at these kind of headline papers from the last few years, we're seeing this catastrophic loss in insect pollinators. And that has really serious consequences. 87% of flowering plants need pollinators okay, in order to survive in the longer term. We've got 76% of major food crops reliant or benefiting from pollination. So if we're losing pollinators, we're going to see a kind of loss of our food supplies in the future. We know that pollination creates resilience against climate change because pollination facilitates the genetic diversity within plant species. So that allows plants to adapt to their changing environments. And there's been a recent study which has linked all ecosystem services. So that's the processes that the environment um, carries out that actively benefit humans. They're all linked to pollinators in some way. <coughs> So that's the global picture. It's a bit doom and gloom and depressing, um, but I'm really interested in what's happening on the Channel Islands. Um, and that's from a personal point of view because I grew up on Guernsey. Um, also from an ecologist point of view, islands are fantastic systems to study because you have a contained space to look at. So you can understand something within a set of boundaries. And also because a lot of the things that we know are affecting pollinators, things like habitat loss, agricultural intensification, the use of pesticides and the loss of wildflowers, are perhaps relevant in different ways on the islands because we have a different history, we have a different type of land use and we're operating on a very different scale. So all of these things make the islands a perfect place to study this kind of thing.
So I'm after data. I want to know which pollinators do we have on the islands? How many are there? So what size are the populations at the moment? Where are they? Are we expecting that the islands will have very similar pollinator communities or would we expect differences in between them? And when were they there? So were they there in the past but not there now? Are they there seasonally? All of those kind of questions. And using that data, I want to build up this picture of pollinator population health. So it's very likely that we will see that there have been declines. OK, I would be amazed if we hadn't seen that on the island. So I'm expecting that downward curve, bracing myself for it. Then I want to think about, well, what's happening right now? What's our current status? Because then we can start to think about how we're going to move forward from that. And then we need to monitor for the future. OK, because if we're going to make changes and we're going to improve our islands for pollinators, we actually need to to make sure that we're doing that in the right way. So that's my focus with this research. So to think about the historical records first and, and the past, okay, how can we understand that? Well, I've already been talking to the Guernsey Biological Records Centre. Liz does a fantastic job there. Um, I'm hoping that there are representatives from the Jersey Biodiversity Centre here today, because um, I'd really like to strike up a conversation with them um, about what data they have on the islands, because those official records obviously give us a really good idea of what we have and what's happening to it. Then we've got groups and organisations like the Wildlife Trust, the Societe. Um, they may hold records themselves, but what we also find is there are often members of these groups who have been around for a long time, who have a keen interest in a particular group, perhaps maybe butterflies or moths. Um, and their own experience is really valuable in understanding what's going on. So if there are people out there listening to this who, who have particular ideas or experience of pollinators, I'd love to have a conversation with you. And then finally, the individual collections. So these are often overlooked um, from a research point of view, but can be extremely valuable. The people who are setting moss traps, recording what they're seeing in their gardens, they may have data sets that run for many years, sitting in a notebook, sitting on a computer. Um, we would love to know about that. So if you were doing that or you know anyone who's doing that on the Channel Islands um, who would be happy to have a conversation and perhaps share some of their data, that would be amazing. So this is my kind of call of action. Um, do people have historical records that they could contribute to this project? So in terms of the current research, I started this work in April. Um, a lot of the plans were disrupted by COVID, so we had to really quickly evolve um, <laughs> to change the project. Um, that has been challenging, but actually it's also been really beneficial. Um, it's kind of created this opportunity for much more local collaboration, uh, which I think has been a really positive thing. And it's also opened up different ideas about citizen science and how we can use local people and their knowledge and expertise to actually try and understand what's going on. So what we've done so far is we've set up some malaise traps. So we've got meadow and garden sites on Alderney, Jersey, Guernsey and Sark. Um, we've set up malaise traps which capture a sample of pollinators that are flying through the air at that site. We've chosen meadows and gardens because they tend to be really diverse um, have diverse pollinator populations. They're good sites for pollinators. So this should just give us that kind of baseline idea of what's actually there at the moment, what is flying about. Uh, we've then been piloting a strawberry bioassay project. This is a really neat little project. So wild strawberries require pollination. They require several rounds of pollination from a mixture of different insects. So the success of a strawberry crop and we can measure that in terms of the number of strawberries, the weight of the strawberries and the lack of deformities on the strawberry. That gives us a really good idea of the level of pollination. If the level of pollination is high, we can assume that the pollination populations are healthy. And then we finally got Bumbler. So some of you hopefully already have this downloaded on your phones. This is an app developed by the Pollinator Project on Guernsey. Um, you can record bumblebee sighting. So we have six bumblebees on Guernsey. Um, 
you download the app when you see a B, you just pop it in. Um, I downloaded the data the other day and we have almost 6,000 records just from the last few months, which is absolutely amazing. So using that citizen science approach here, that so far has been absolutely fantastic. So for the future, taking this forward, um, my plan is to be working on this for the next sort of four to five years, perhaps longer. That would be nice. <laughs> um, what we'd like to do is to continue doing the work with the malaise traps, the strawberry bioassay and with Bumbler. We'll carry that forward. Obviously, malaise traps are a catch and kill method. So we'll be monitoring that carefully and we will only be doing that to the level where we still need to be collecting those specimens. What I'd like to bring in next year is some moth data. So moths are important pollinators and they're often neglected because they're nighttime pollinators. Um, if we can bring that in by using some moth traps on the different islands, and I know that there are people doing this already, so it'd be great to talk to anyone who's running a long-term moth trap um, to try and include that in the project. Um, we're going to run some pollinator transects. So these would be very sort of scientifically rigorous transects, walking through a site, recording the pollinators and what they're feeding on. So that helps us to build up an idea of what plants are these insects associated with, which can then help with future management. I'd like to then kind of make a citizen science project out of that. So using Bumbler to actually create Bumbler transects where anybody can go walk a transect that would perhaps be along a cliff path or in a nature reserve and record what they're seeing. So then we can get that kind of replication of data, which would be really valuable. Now, been in contact with some people in Jersey um, and in Jersey the pollinator project is looking at mapping pollinator patches. Uh, this is something that we definitely like to see rolled out across all of the islands so that we can actually begin to understand how much habitat there is for pollinators. And then finally this is the thing I'm thinking about at the moment is how we can kind of roll out the strawberry bioassay within a citizen science context. So this is perhaps something that children could do at home. They could be given a strawberry plant, take it home and then record how many strawberries they get, which would be a really nice approach. So if we kind of bring all of these things together, what I'm hoping to have is this sort of fantastic collaborative wheel of research, which is basically broken down into citizen science projects, field research and the use of historical data. So that is my dream, that wheel. So we talked about all this data, recording, understanding what's going on, but we also need to have action in place to help pollinators. Now, hopefully a lot of you will have heard about or maybe even attended the Pesticide Free Guernsey Forum, which was last year. This is a move by the Pollinator Project to really try and discourage the use of pesticides on the island. And what we'd like to see is in the next couple of years, Guernsey significantly reducing and even banning the non-essential use of pesticides, because we know that pesticides harm pollinators. They're poisons, we put them into the environment and they're clearly doing damage. So if we can have some sort of decisive action on pesticides in the next couple of years, that should help to drive us up that nice green upward curve on the other side of the graph. And what I'd like to see with the other islands in an ideal scenario is that if we can do this successfully on Guernsey, we can then use the data that we're collecting to show how successful this is to then implement it on other islands and elsewhere around the world. So just to talk about this within the, the broader context of what's going on in the world, and this is going to be quite an um, this is a UK centric point of view. So I apologise to all the people from France. I know that France has a pollinator strategy, um, but this is just looking at the UK context. So Wales uh, was the first in the UK to have a pollinator strategy. Um, this is in 2013. And we can basically break that down into four key points based on their outcomes. So they're interested in data. That data collection is obviously key. Land management, so how can we improve habitat for pollinators? Then this third point here is quite interesting. When you dig into this within, within the bigger document, you actually see that this pollinator 
populations are healthy is actually about honeybees. So this is thinking about the commercial side of pollination. Now, there's definitely been a change in the way that we view honeybees and their role as pollinators. Um, and I'll talk about that a bit when we get to the, the Scotland strategy. But honeybees are in there as a, as a key outcome. And then finally, public engagement, which is really important. We have to kind of uh, share what we're doing with people so that they can help support it, they can help drive policy forward, and that they can do their own bit at home. So England followed shortly afterwards, um, and they very much have the same four points here. They were, I think they were very much using the wealth strategy as a blueprint. So we see pretty much the same kind of actions coming out here. Data, land management, honeybees, and the public engagement. Then we move to Scotland, and Scotland is the most recent in terms of publishing their strategy. This is in 2017. Um, that date up at the top there, that should be 2027, not 2127. That's a very long-term project. <laughs> um, so they've obviously learned from the Welsh and the English strategies, and what they've done in Scotland is create a slightly more nuanced um, approach. So what we're seeing is a five point plan. And if we break this down, we're seeing land management plus. So it's not just about creating habitat for pollinators, but it's actually doing things beyond that. How can we improve habitat? How can we take other steps to try and help pollinators? Again, we're seeing the data, of course, that underpins everything and is really key. We then have this point about honeybees, but the tone in which they're addressed within this strategy is very different. So managing the commercial use of pollinators to, mm -hmm. to benefit mm -hmm. native pollinators. And I think this is a really key point um, that actually honeybees are commercial species. So we need to view them differently um, in terms of the potential impacts that they might have on our native pollinators. Then we've got public engagement, of course. And finally, this idea about evidence to continue monitoring and to continue evaluating moving forward so that we can actually provide evidence that what we're doing is positive. So based on those three strategies, um, we've had some really great successes. OK, you may be familiar with the Beelines in initiative. It's been in the press recently, actually. Um, these little red lines indicate where habitat is being joined up to help create a network for pollinators. And we've certainly seen a huge increase in public awareness through a lot of initiatives sort of um, bringing together these bee-friendly patches, wildlife havens, just sharing that with the public. I've only got a couple of slides left. Um, so in terms of the data, it's been a bit slower. We've had this great report um, on the status and value of pollinators in 2014. The key thing that came out of that was that regular monitoring is essential and more evidence is definitely required. So for the Channel Islands, without writing a 100-page policy document, okay, we need to describe, monitor and improve our pollinator populations. Land management plus, so thinking about how we can improve habitat, but also take action in terms of things like pesticides to help benefit pollinators. Public engagement, we're already excelling on, I think. The Pollinator Project does such a fantastic job. And within that, we should continue the conversation about honeybees and the impacts that they have on native pollinators. And then finally, the data and the evidence. So I'm hoping that my project can really contribute to this, but I'd like this to be collaborative. I'd like people to get involved um, and I'd like to include as many of the local organisations in this as possible. And in my ideal world, the Channel Islands can create this kind of landscape scale evidence for success, which can then be shared with the rest of the world to put the Channel Islands on the map um, and to be really a leader in this. So I'll leave you with that. Those, that's my contact information. Um, and please, any questions and get in touch. Thank you. Thanks.